Good morning, Section Z. How are you doing this morning? Uh, today, we're going to end our discussion of easements in the book, and we're going to look at the issue of termination of easements. So let me share the screen with you here. Um, here we are over on page 527, and the case that is given to us by the authors is an interesting case from the Federal Circuit called Presalt versus United States. Not sure if that's how you ought to pronounce it. Maybe it's Preso, but I'm going to call them the Presalts and hope I didn't get it too badly wrong. Um, so this case has to do with a strip of land that runs through three parcels, all owned by the plaintiffs, the, the Presalts. Um, and the parcels are A, B, and C on a map that is over on page 530. So let's go to the map and take a look at that. Um, so here is parcel A, here's parcel B, and here's parcel C over here. And this strip of land kind of cuts uh, along the border between A and B and then through the middle of parcel C. Um, it was originally a railroad line. It was uh, used for railroad service until 1970 when uh, rail service ended. Um, and then in 1975, the railroad removed the tracks from, uh, from this line. Um, at the time of the opinion, the strip of land is being used differently. Uh, it's being used for a public hiking and biking trail. Uh, so in 1985, the railroad entered into an agreement with the state of Vermont and the city of Burlington uh, to maintain the strip of land as a public trail. Uh, that agreement with Vermont and Burlington was submitted to a federal agency, the Interstate Commerce Commission, which approved it in 1986 under a federal statute called the Rails to Trails Act. Um, by the way, I think the mayor of Burlington, Vermont in 1986 was somebody you may know, Bernie Sanders. Uh, so maybe the persults here are feeling the burn in this case. Um, so what is the claim that the persults are making? They claim that the government, um, and there's some ambiguity in that because there are actually three governments involved, the city government, the state government, and the federal government, but they claim the government has taken their property and therefore has to pay just compensation pursuant to the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution uh, that says that no property shall be taken for, private, uh, for public use without just compensation. Um, and so they are claiming the government took their land um, and owes them money to compensate for that taking. Um, now, this is a claim that is based on federal law. It's the United States Constitution, the federal constitution, that creates the obligation to compensate somebody justly when uh, their land is taken for public use. Um, so why do we spend so much time in the opinion talking about Vermont law? What does state law have to do with this federal law claim for compensation for a taking? Um, and it, points to kind of the interaction between federal takings law and state property law. Uh, federal takings law gives you the principle that uh, you have to compensate if you take property, but federal law does not normally define what property is. That is something that is typically done uh, as a matter of state law. And so we have to look to state law to decide whether the plaintiffs have a property interest that has been taken from them uh, by government action for public use. And then if we decide under state law that they had a property interest that was taken, then uh, the federal law would kick in and require compensation. Um, so basically the argument boils down to whether the plaintiffs have any property rights that were taken away by the government's approval of conversion of this old rail line to use for a public hiking and biking trail. Um, and the government's first argument that the plaintiffs don't have any property is that uh, when 
the strip of land was acquired by the railroad uh, over lots A, B, and C, that really what uh, was acquired was fee simple interest in that strip of land. It's, this was not merely an easement, this was actually uh, ownership of that strip of land by the railroad in fee simple, uh, albeit a very long and narrow strip of land, but that the railroad owned it. They didn't simply have the right to use land belonging to underlying landowners. Um, so the court has to look at that issue and the answer is fairly easy for the court with respect to lots A and B. Um, the railroad uh, got that strip of land over lots A and B uh, by something called a commissioner's award. So this was a condemnation action under the power of eminent domain, um, under Vermont law, and Vermont law was very clear that when a railroad acquired uh, rights in property by virtue of eminent domain, that the railroad only got the minimum rights that it needed, the minimum estate it needed in order to conduct its operations. And so that means that we would interpret what the railroad got over lots A and B as a, an easement, not as fee simple ownership. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated when you get to lot C. Um, and so if you look at the top of page 531, in this case, there was not actually a condemnation action um, that, that led to a commissioner's award. Instead, there was just a grant of uh, rights in the strip of land over lot C. And if you look at the deed, um, they tell us the top of 531, the deed contains the usual habendum clause found in a warranty deed and purports to convey the described strip of land to the grantee railroad, quote, to have and to hold the above granted and bargained premises and to it and the said grantee, its successors and assigns forever to its and their own proper use, benefit and behoof forever. Uh, it goes on and further warrants that the grantors have a good indefeasible estate in fee simple and have good right to bargain and sell the same in manner and form as above written. Uh, and so the court concedes that the deed appears to be the standard form used to convey a fee simple title from a grantor to a grantee. Um, and so if you just look at the deed that was granted over lot C to the strip of land, it looks like a grant of a fee simple interest in the strip of land as it uh, crossed lot C. Um, so we're talking about this portion of the rail line right here on page five, 530. Um, so that kind of raises the question, um, would it be possible, uh, you know, what does the court say? Well, it says that um, in this case, uh, we're gonna look to Vermont case law um, and even when there's a deed that looks like a fee simple, the Vermont case law tells us that the railroad still acquires only the minimum that it needs for its operations. Um, so even if it was by a voluntary conveyance, the railroad only got an easement rather than fee simple interest. Um, and the court so effectively kind of ignores the language of the deed, um, which raises the question, is it possible uh, under this Vermont case law for a railroad to acquire a fee simple interest in land that it's using for its rail lines? Um, or is it limited to the acquisition of an easement? I mean, imagine that you are in a negotiation, uh, you are selling the railroad uh, the right to use a strip of land, you discuss the possibilities of an easement or fee simple, the railroad promises that they'll pay you more if you give them a fee simple interest and you agree to do that. Um, how would you write the deed to convey that intention um, under this case law? I mean, do you, do you say, uh, the grantor hereby conveys title and fee simple to the railroad and its successors and, assign, and assigns, and we really, really mean it, uh, all in caps with exclamation points? Would that be enough to convince the court? Um, would you say, um, we are conveying a fee simple interest to the rail railroad, its successors and assigns, and we are not conveying an easement. Um, 
you know, how would you draft a deed to convey a fee simple, or is that simply impossible under Vermont law in the circumstances that we're looking at? So the court shoots down the government's argument that there was no taking because the railroad owned this strip of land in fee simple. Uh, so the next argument that the government makes is, okay, if we assume this was an easement over that strip of land, nevertheless, there's no taking because the current use of the land is within the scope of that easement. We're using uh, the land in a way that is consistent with the easement that was granted. Um, and so here it was an easement for railroad use. Now it's being used for hiking, biking, walking pets, and that sort of thing. Is that within the scope of the easement that uh, the railroad got? Um, and the court applies a test of reasonable foreseeability. Uh, it says, you know, at the time that the railroad acquired these rights, was it reasonably foreseeable that it would uh, be used for public trails at some point? Was that within the scope of the rights uh, that the parties bargained for? Um, the court decides that it was not reasonably foreseeable, that the easement was granted for use for a rail line and that this is a very different route use that would not be reasonably foreseeable by the parties when the easement was created. Um, and so the court has shut down the government's arguments that um, the railroad didn't have fee simple interest and it had an easement and the current use is exceeding the scope of that easement. And so that seems to be enough to show that there is some property right that the presalts had uh, that is being interfered with uh, by the government's permission to the public to use this as a trail. Um, but what then the court goes on and addresses a different issue. Um, it looks to the question of whether the use of the rail lines was abandoned by the, the railroad company. Um, and that kind of raises a puzzle. Why do you need to look at that issue of abandonment when you've already resolved the, the point that there were property rights that this uh, current use is interfering with? Um, and I guess maybe the answer is that, um, well, if the rail line was abandoned, then that gives you an alternative uh, ground for saying that there was a taking of property here and that the compensation to the plaintiffs for, uh, for um, taking those property rights might be greater. Um, you know, maybe if you have exceeded the scope of an easement, the just compensation would be a smaller amount, but if there was no easement at all, if the easement was completely abandoned, then giving the public permission to walk over somebody's property might result in a, a higher award for just compensation. Um, so, we have to decide whether the railroad abandoned its rail line. Um, the first thing to think about is, is it significant that uh, the railroad stopped using the rail line for a railroad back in the 1970s? Um, well, it's significant, but it is not enough by itself. The court tells us that non-use of an easement is not enough to show abandonment. Um, they say that under Vermont law, uh, quote, in order to establish an abandonment, there must be, in addition to non-use, acts by the owner of the dominant tenement conclusively and unequivocally manifesting either a present intent to relinquish the easement or a purpose inconsistent with its future existence. Um, so was there evidence here to show an intention to abandon the easement? And the court decides there was. They point to the removal of the railroad uh, tracks and equipment from the land and deem that to be evidence of abandonment. Um, after the case and the notes, the authors wonder whether the evidence of abandonment was really sufficient to reach that conclusion. There was evidence going the other way. For instance, the railroad continued to execute license agreements with uh, adjoining landowners who wanted to cross over this uh, right of way. Um, and so they seem to be continuing to, to act as if they had rights in that strip of land after they removed the tracks. Um, there was also the fact that the railroad 
left the bridges in place. They took out the tracks, but they left bridges standing. Uh, the court doesn't find that persuasive because um, there was nothing obligating the, tr the railroad to take out the bridges, and so that just would have uh, increased their cost. They had a reason to take out the tracks and other equipment because they could use that elsewhere in their operations, but they didn't have any uh, reason to take out the bridges, and so the fact that they're still standing uh, is not persuasive to show there was no abandonment of the easement here. Um, the final section of the opinion, the court addresses whether there's been a taking of the plaintiff's property, um, and the court finds that there has. Now, kind of raises a question about takings law. Is the government using the property here? Well, not the government itself, really, but they are giving the public the right to use it. They're allowing people to use this strip of land for hiking, biking, pet walking, and the like. Um, and so that is sufficient to find that the government has taken the property and to trigger the obligation of paying just compensation. All right, now in the notes after the case, um, I'm not sure what I've done here, but uh, let me see if I can pull this up again and get to the notes after the case. We're gonna look at page 536. Note one. All right. All right, 536 note one has to do with methods of terminating an easement. Um, and so this might be a good opportunity to do a little bit of review about ways that you can create an easement and then ways that you can terminate an easement. And so uh, pay careful attention to that note because it could be helpful to you. Um, but let me pull up a list that I created of different ways that we saw that an easement can be created. Um, and so on creation of easements, we have express grants. Um, you can have a deed that grants somebody an easement. We had easements created by implication. One way that they could be created by implication is when you sever two lots and it's necessary for uh, one of those lots to retain an easement over the other. Uh, another way that you could create uh, an easement without an express grant was by implication from a pre-existing use. At the time of severance, you were using one part of the land for the benefit of the other part of the land. Uh, and there's a reasonable necessity con to continue. Um, another way to create an easement was estoppel. Um, th there were some act or, or uh, statements by one party. The other party relied upon them to its detriment. Um, and we saw this in particular in the context of whether a license can become irrevocable and effectively become an easement by estoppel um, under principles of estoppel. Uh, we saw that easements can create, be created by prescription, by using the easement for long enough for the statute of limitations to run and prevent uh, the, the person from making a claim to prevent you from using it. Um, one other way that you could create an easement that I'm not sure was mentioned previously, but that, uh, that we should uh, mention for completion, uh, uh, completeness is condemnation. If the government needed an easement over a particular piece of land, uh, then they could simply condemn the easement and acquire the rights paying just compensation in exchange. Um, so in this material on termination of easements, I wanted to, to note for you that there are actually parallels to many of the ways that an easement can be created. Um, and so um, an ex easement can be created expressly by a deed or a grant. And similarly, it can be released. Um, and the authors tell us that um, that might well under the statute of frauds have to also be done by uh, a written instrument. 
Um, or maybe the grant that created the easement in the first place had some kind of natural expiration date to it. Uh, and so maybe it was an easement for a certain number of years and at the end of those years it would terminate. Or uh, maybe it's defeasible. We saw that for instance in the Willard case where the church was uh, given a, an easement for parking so long as the property was used for church purposes. Um, and so that one was defeasible. If the property ever got, a, got converted to something other than a church, then the easement would naturally disappear uh, because it was defeasible. Um, another way you can terminate an easement, this would uh, apply to lots of different ways that easements could be created, but you could have an easement that ends by abandonment. We saw that in the Basalt case. Um, we talked about how easements can be implied by necessity. If you have an easement implied by necessity, then we saw that um, when the necessity ends, that easement also ends. But note that that was a theory of termination that only applied to easement by necessity. If the easement was actually created by uh, pre-existing use, then ending the necessity would not terminate the easement. Um, Another way easements can be created is merger of the dom or can be terminated as merger of the dominant and servient estates. We've seen this principle that you can't have an easement over your own land. And so if you end up uh, having the same person acquire both the dominant estate and the servient estate, then the easement disappears because uh, you can no longer have an easement in those facts. Um, Easements can be created by estoppel. Similarly, they can be ended by estoppel. Uh, it could be that um, the, the person uh, who has, is the uh, dominant uh, tenement owner uh, says something or does something that indicates that they no longer want the easement um, or don't intend to use it anymore. And maybe the owner of the servient tenement uh, changes positions in reliance upon uh, those representations by the dominant tenement owner, then uh, that could result in an estoppel that would prevent the holder of the dominant tenement from claiming that the easement still existed. Um, you can have an easement terminated by prescription. Um, and so if the easement is blocked uh, and you're prevented from using it for long enough to uh, run the statute of limitations, then you can lose your claim to reopen the easement. Um, and just as an easement can be created by condemnation, it could also be terminated by condemnation. The government might decide that they need to purchase an entire lot, including all interest in the lot, um, and so that could have the effect of eliminating any easements that other people had over that lot, uh, although presumably in exchange they would get just compensation. Now, one point to make here is that um, in certain cases, there's a, a connection between uh, the way an easement is created and the way it's terminated. So easement by necessity is created by the existence of the necessity at the time of severance. Um, and when that necessity ends, that easement ends. But many of these ways of terminating an easement could apply regardless of how the easement was created. So you could have an easement created by an express grant that was terminated by condemnation. Um, you could have an easement created by prescription that was terminated by merger of the dominant and serving the states, et cetera. Um, finally, uh, let's take a look at material at the end of this section on easements. Um, over here on page 536, uh, we have a discussion of what are called negative easements. And we distinguish early on between affirmative easements and negative easements. Uh, affirmative easements are like a right of way that gives a person, the holder of the dominant tenement, the right to go on to the servient land and do something. So for instance, they can cross over the servient tenement to get access to the dominant tenement uh, or to a public road. Um, negative easements don't allow the holder of the easement to do something. They instead allow the holder of the easement to prevent the servient owner from doing something. Um, and notice they tell you that this was um, Th this did not become a long list. There are only a certain number of 
negative easements that were recognized in English law. Um, you had, it could prevent uh, a neighboring landowner from blocking your windows if you had a negative easement, interfering with airflow, uh, removing support for your building, interfering with flow of water, et cetera. Um, and they tell us that in America, uh, there have been a few additional uh, negative easements recognized in scattered locations. So um, in a case from California, uh, they recognized an easement um, of unobstructed view. Here it was an express easement where uh, apparently somebody had um, a, a grant that that gave them the right to an unobstructed view, um, and the court enforced that as a kind of a negative easement. Um, and, you know, a solar easement, there's some case law to that effect. Um, but uh, the most important negative easement that has been recognized in recent years is the conservation easement. For the most part, there hasn't been any pressure to create new negative easements because anything that you'd want to do with a negative easement, you effectively can do through an equitable servitude that we will study in the next part of the book. And so uh, this theory just doesn't get litigated very often. Sometimes you will use, uh, you will see courts talking about equitable servitudes, but using the language of negative easements um, and uh, you know, that, uh, just recognize that if that's happening, they're, they're really talking about the theory of equitable, equitable servitude. Um, but con conservation easements are uh, becoming more popular in this country. Basically, the, this is uh, something that is now permitted by statute, uh, I think, in all of the jurisdictions, they say. Um, but you can basically uh, give a conservation easement in property that you own either to the government or to like a private uh, environmental organization. Um, and what that does is it gives the holder of the easement the right to prevent you from doing any development on the land. Um, if you give it to a charitable organization, then you often get the right to do declare that as a tax deduction, a charitable gift of the development rights on the land. Um, and so that uh, those are increasingly popular and there are uh, large swaths of land in the United States that are now subject to conservation easements that prevent them from being developed. Um, one question I've wondered about is um, how secure are those conservation easements? How long will they last? Um, you know, what if it got to the point where there was so much land tied up in conservation easements that it seemed to be having negative impacts that uh, we needed the land for, uh, for development purposes and it was out of circulation because of the conservation easements. Um, my suspicion at that point is that what would happen is the government would exercise its power of eminent domain it would acquire the land that it thinks needs to be back in circulation, pay just compensation for that. Um, and just compensation may not be that high if the land is subject to a conservation easement that restricts its development um, and put it back in circulation that way. So um, for now, land subject to conservation easements uh, is protected against development and maybe indefinitely, but uh, I could imagine the situation evolving in a way that uh, the government decided that, that we needed to kind of bring land back into circulation that had been taken out of the market through conservation easements. Um, and that ends our discussion of easements in the book. Uh, we're scheduled to meet Thursday morning for uh, the beginning of our discussion of covenants and equitable servitudes. So I will see you there.